When I was a child, my dad did not allow me to disagree with him. I can remember many times standing in front of him, tears streaming down my cheeks because I felt like I was misunderstood, not being heard, not being taken seriously, and I would say, but dad, and he would cut me off and he'd say, I don't want to hear any if, ands, or buts about it. And I'd say, but dad, he'd say, didn't I just tell you? I don't want to hear anything from you. Just do what I told you to do. My dad was the boss and I was not allowed to disagree with him. There was no discussion. If I dared to disagree with him, I would be punished. Now, it is true that parents are the ones who set the rules for children. Children need rules and they have to come from the parents. It's also true that uh, the parents make the final decision for their children. But you know, as children grow, uh, you need to negotiate uh, those rules with the children. And you need to negotiate uh, what they can do and what they can't do. Because if you don't allow a child to disagree, if you don't allow a child to have their own opinion or perspective and to be able to, to talk back, to, to be able to say how they're feeling, if you don't allow that, then you're stunting their moral development. In order for us to morally grow, we need to be able to question. We need to be able to ask those hard questions, wrestle with those questions, reason together. That's how we develop our sense of, of what's right, what's wrong, and what to do. Genesis 18 is, in my opinion, one of the most important passages in the entire Bible. It is the story of Abraham debating with God morality. The story begins this way. Abraham is sitting in front of his tent one day, and he sees three travelers coming down the road. He immediately pops up, runs over to them, bows down, and says, why don't you come and sit down in the shade of my tree over here while my wife and I will, will make some lunch for you. And the travelers agree. Now, two of those travelers are angels, and one of them is God. While we're all having lunch together under the tree, God says to Abraham that Sarah, his wife, is going to have a child very soon which is funny news to Sarah, and she laughs about that. After the meal is over, the two angels get up, and they begin moving off down the road. God hangs back, you might say, and talks with Abraham. God says to Abraham, A great cry has gone up against the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. I've heard terrible things about what they're doing in these cities. And I'm going to go and check it out. And if it's true what I've been hearing, well, I may need to destroy these cities. Now, this is of great concern to Abraham because his nephew Lot and Lot's family lives in one of those cities. They live in the city of Sodom. It used to be that Lot was a rancher like like Abraham, he had lots of flocks, but apparently at some point he traded that in for city life. Maybe he was attracted to the city because that's where there's more jobs and more opportunities, more things to do and more entertainment. Of course, cities also have drawbacks. Uh, cities are more stratified. You know, there, there's more disparity between the rich and the poor. There's more disparity between those who have power and those who don't have power. There's more disparity between status. And this creates resentment in cities. There's also more anonymity in cities. And so, you know, not everybody knows each other. And because of that, well, there's less accountability. There's less of a sense of responsibility. And so there's more crime. And indeed, Sodom and Gomorrah are crime-ridden cities. In fact, these two angels are going to discover pretty soon that Sodom is a city that is completely unsafe to any visitor because any visitor gets attacked and molested. 
if they're in that city overnight. As those two angels are making their way down the road, Abraham responds to God, asks a question. Will you wipe out all the people in those cities if there's good people in those cities, if there's innocent people in those cities? I, I mean, what, if there's, what if there's 50 innocent people in the city of Sodom? Would you wipe out the entire city, kill everybody, let, let the, the good die along with the evil? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to, to let the innocent die with the guilty. Far be it from you. This phrase, far be it from you, uh, is actually kind of a, a gentle translation. The Hebrew has more of the force of, this is profane. It is profane for you to let the innocent die with the guilty. That's profane. You who are the judge of the whole earth, don't you need to do justice? That's Abraham's question. It's a really good question. Doesn't God need to be just? The famous Greek philosopher, Socrates, he posed the question this way. He says, is something good because God wills it, or does God will it because it's good? Or another way to put it is, does God define goodness, or does goodness define God? Socrates insisted, goodness defines God. God is not free to choose to be ungood. God is not free to choose to be unjust, because God wouldn't be God if God isn't good and just. Abraham is making, I think, exactly the same argument. God. Far be it from you, it would be profane of you to let the innocent die with the guilty. That's, that's immoral. That's wrong. You would cease to be God if you allowed that to happen. Now, think about how audacious this is, what, what, what Abraham is, is claiming here. He is presuming that he has within himself a sense of right and wrong that God must conform to. Wow. So how does God respond to this? Does God get angry and say, I don't want to hear any ifs, ands, or buts about it. Hey, I'm God. I decide what's right and wrong, not you. Be quiet. That's not what God does. Instead, God agrees. God says, you're right, Abraham, if there's 50 innocent people there in Sodom, for their sake, I will not destroy the rest of the city. Well, now that that moral principle has been established, Abraham wants to see how far he can push that. So he says, well, well what if it's only 45 innocent people? Would, would you save the city for the sake of 45? Well, how about 40? How about 30? What if it's only 20? What if it's only 10 innocent people? And each time God says, I'll agree to that. I'll agree to that. I'll agree to that. Now we expect Abraham to bring it right down to one and you know, to say to God, well, what if there's just one innocent person in Sodom? You know, would you save the city for the sake of that one? Uh, but he doesn't bring it down to one, and, and maybe it's because if there's less than 10 innocent people in Sodom, that small number would be able to escape the city and not be destroyed, which is indeed exactly what happens, because those two angels are going to help Lot and his family, they're less than 10, escape the city before it's destroyed. So there's no harm done to the innocent. Now let's consider this moral principle 
that God and Abraham have established. It is immoral to punish those who do wrong, those who engage in destructive behavior, if in that punishment we also harm innocent people. Or to put it another way, the need to protect the innocent outweighs the need to punish the guilty. Now, it's true that we do need to hold accountable those whose behavior is destructive. We need to. Every society needs to. If we don't do that, society will fall apart. We need to hold accountable those who do destructive things. We need to find a way to prevent that, to stop that. But if in our attempts to stop that and prevent that, if we are also then doing harm to the innocent, well then, we've got to find a different way to do it. Thousands of years have gone by now, and we are still struggling with how to live out that moral principle. In World War II, we were so determined to wipe out the Nazis that we firebombed Dresden, saturation bombing of all these German cities, indiscriminate bombing, saturation bombing, kept bombing, killing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of innocent people. In fact, I, I know a man who was in one of those German cities. He was a five-year-old boy. And the bombs were raining down one night. And his mother's holding him. And the, the bombing is so in, incessant that, that it, it breaks the, the, the will of his mother. And, and she prays to God, please let the next bomb kill us. While the little boy is praying, please God, let us not be killed. Our country dropped two atomic bombs on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, killed over 100,000 people, and most of those people were civilians. More, in more recent history, our country invaded Iraq, and the first action was to bomb Baghdad. Now, it's true, our military targeted military installations. But we knew that even though we were targeting military installations, there would be collateral damage. There'd be innocent people who would be killed. Well, according to Genesis 18, that is profane. Or consider the death penalty. We have a number of people that are on death row in this country. And statistically, we've been able to figure out that uh, from time to time, there's an innocent person on death row. You know, DNA has proven the innocence of a variety of people who are on death row. What we have realized is that our justice system is not perfect. We do sometimes get it wrong. There are biases in the system. So should we continue to execute people if we know that uh, probably there's some innocent people in there too. Now, why does God allow Abraham to debate with God, God's morality? Why would God allow that? Well, earlier in the story, and it's not in the lectionary reading, you have to back up a few verses, you have God having an internal dialogue. God says to God's self, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do in Sodom and Gomorrah? Or should I hide it? Should I not tell him? No, I should tell him. So that he may learn the way of righteousness and justice. In other words, God is inviting 
Abraham into this discussion purposely. God wants the feedback of Abraham. God wants pushback from Abraham. God wants Abraham to think for himself because this is how we grow morally. This is how we learn the way of righteousness and justice. You know, in the Bible, there are various people who argue with God, God's morality. Moses does in the book of Numbers. Job does in the book of Job. Many of the psalmists do in the Psalms. And in none of these cases are these biblical people blamed for doing that. This is what the Bible allows them to do. Because this is how we grow morally. It's not enough for us to blindly obey a set of rules. Even if those set of rules are in the Bible, it's not enough to blindly obey that. Blind obedience to rules or to an authority figure, even blind obedience to God, is not morality. Morality has to be in here, not on a written page. It has to be in here. It has to be something that we have found through our questioning, through our discussions, through our reasoning, through, through asking those tough questions and, and figuring out what is right, what is wrong. And it's only when we do that that we become the children of Abraham. 